listening to episode two of the Blind Side Rugby Podcast with me, your host, Chris Hutton. I want to thank all of you very much for tuning in last week to the first episode. There was an overwhelmingly uh, amazing response. I want to thank all of you for taking some time to listen to that first episode, and I very much hope we can keep that momentum going. Please tell your friends and co-workers about the podcast, share the links on your various social media platforms, and hopefully we can keep it going as best as possible. So this week on episode two, I'm going to start off with some news. Uh, Again, just to remind you all of my All Blacks and Crusaders uh, supporting history. The focus will very much be on sort of New Zealand rugby, but I'm trying to cover as much rugby as possible uh, in the Southern Hemisphere and Northern Hemisphere. Um, As much as I love watching rugby, it's difficult to fit everything in over the weekends. But I think I'm managing to watch um, pretty much every tournament that's on offer at the moment, and I can give you guys all the news and results and my views on everything going on as best as I can. Right, so in news this week, uh, All Blacks and Chiefs lock Brody Retallick will leave the Chiefs after the this year's World Cup in Japan. He's going to play for two seasons in, in Japan with the Cobalco Steelers team. He'll return in 2021, and that's uh, after agreeing to an extension until the end of 2023. Potentially huge transfer news, and we always talk about transfers in, in soccer or football, um, for those of you on different sides of the Atlantic. Um, with, uh, with the transfer news, Bowden Barrett could be moving to the Blues. Now, Bowden Barrett plays for the Hurricanes. He has for a long time. He's also the number one fly half for the All Blacks. He was close to joining the Blues in 2016, apparently. Uh, he is now 28 and he's played 73 tests for the All Blacks. He's one of the All Black's most important players by a country mile. He hasn't yet announced his plans after this year uh, and after the World Cup. If he does sign for the Blues, he won't play for them until 2021 because he has said he's taking a sabbatical next year. Um, there was news last year that some French clubs were, inter- were willing to pay upwards of uh, $2 million New Zealand dollars per year to lure him to the continent, but that hasn't happened just yet. Uh, and then finally, Steve Tu will step down as CEO of the New Zealand Rugby Union at the end of this year after 12 years of service. So it'll be interesting to see who they can get in uh, to come in after him. We know New Zealand Rugby is very well organized. And thus far, I think he's done a really good job um, in his tenure. In a column on All Out Rugby, Jake White wrote that he does not believe South Africa's new contracting model is going to work. Uh, he has supported a privatization measure of, of sorts. Uh, that's, you know, privatization is what some people are advocating for with ESCOM and SAA. So now he's advocating for a sort of privatization of the Springbok brand that be sold to the highest bidder. Uh, and I quote here from his article, Under the new contracting model, SA Rugby is actively telling players to go overseas with no fear that it will affect their chances of playing for the Springboks, end quote. SA Rugby as a whole should be put on sale to the highest bidder. And I quote again, for example, a billionaire Qatari, end quote. Uh, another quote, moving to SA Rugby, moving SA Rugby to a tax haven like Dubai would save even more money and put the headquarters in a centralized location, end quote. Now, it's obviously a very interesting proposal. I highly doubt that SARU, that's a South African rugby union, will support it. But at least Jake White, who obviously won the World Cup with the Springboks in 2007, he's putting his views out there. Uh, please let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Or wherever you're listening, maybe if you can tweet it, tweet at me uh, on, uh, please find me on Twitter or on Facebook and let me know what you think. Do you think privatization of the spring box will help solve many of the problems there? Do you think that's the way forward or do you think it should still, you know, be owned by the government in effect or the South African rugby union? Um, uh, for South Africans, especially this, this next piece of news is exciting. Uh, Warren Gatland was confirmed as the British and Irish Lions coach for the 2021 tour of South Africa. This is after he guided the team to a drawn series in New Zealand on their previous tour, where uh, New Zealand won one game, the British and Irish Lions won one game, and they drew the final game. I was listening to the Will Greenwood rugby podcast, which I can highly advise all of you to find. That's on the Sky Sports list of podcasts. Uh, on on Will Greenwood's podcast, they talked to Gatlin straight after the announcement. Uh, he he mentioned that he was very surprised at the level of vitriol from the media during the New Zealand tour. He is, of course, a New Zealander, so he was surprised and a bit taken aback by that. I don't think the media in South Africa will handle him quite as um, 
not badly, but with such hostility as the media in New Zealand. Uh, I think the Lions are definitely favorites for the tour, obviously depending on injuries and that kind of thing. I'm very excited for that tour. It's going to be great to see the Lions here in South Africa again. Um, and it always raises the, the stakes and the, the level of rugby, I think, on both sides of so the Springboks. I'm sure will be well up for that series. Um, and the, the traveling British and Irish Lions fans are, <laughs> are very, very entertaining to say the least. So it'll be good to maybe interact with some of them and get their views on, on rugby in general. I think Gatland is probably the best option besides probably Joe Schmidt, but Schmidt himself is done after the World Cup with Ireland. He's done very well with Ireland, and I thought he might be in line to be the next All Blacks coach. Um, but we'll see. He said that he wants to now spend time with his family and focus on that, but I wonder if a lucrative contract couldn't him con- couldn't convince him to maybe sign with the, the New Zealand Rugby Union. Um, in player news... Will Jordan, uh, he has re-signed with the Crusaders until 2022. Uh, Nihi Milnaskada, in a post on Instagram, um, he just gave us an update on his current sort of recuperation. He has undergone another surgery on his shoulder. I really hope he can make a comeback. Um, he came out of nowhere before and into the last World Cup. He's a real game changer. Uh, and I don't see, uh, one doesn't say that often because New Zealand is replete with amazing uh, outside backs but for him to stand out shows you how special he was so i'm hoping he can mount some sort of comeback in some way obviously i don't think it'll be in time for the world cup but maybe in the years to come the um, milner scudder is probably one of my favorite players um, for the southern kings and we don't often talk about them but this is great news for them uh, dimitri katrakilis uh, he has previously played for Western Province, he's played in France, and he's an old boy from St. John's, my old high school. He will play for the Southern, Southern Kings from next season, so that's a great signing for them. Hopefully he'll help them in their, sort of in their northern adventures. We'll see if he can help guide them to some more success. Uh, 22-year-old Sevu Reese, he's the wing, one of the wings for the Crusaders, has been named as the Super Rugby Rookie of the Year. He has scored 13 tries in 11 appearances so far this season. He beat uh, Blues forward Tom Robinson, also known by, uh, known affectionately by those in the New Zealand media as Clifford the Big Red Dog. <laughs> um, he beat Tom Robinson to that award. Uh, I wonder if he'll be pulled into the All Black setup in some capacity. I'm sure he won't be, you know, picked as a starter for the All Blacks. Definitely not in the World Cup, but hopefully they can start pulling him in and start. Um, you know, showing him the ropes and that kind of thing. He'll, he's definitely a star to watch for the future, if not the immediate future. Uh, on uh, a Northern Hemisphere team, France may sacrifice vice captain Mathieu Bastereau in the need for speed at the Rugby World Cup. Uh, changes are expected to the French side after another disappointing Six Nations campaign. Incoming French coach Fabien Galti who will take over from Jacques Brunel after the World Cup, has had input into discussions on the squad composition, and I'm sure he's given his views on Bastereau. Bastereau is a... Yeah, he's been consistent in the French team, a consistent name. Uh, I don't think he's one of the standout centers in world rugby. He is a very big guy, brings a lot of power, but I think France might try and recalibrate their whole setup to a more speedy approach, um, and obviously that's not going to work with him in the center there, just doing crash ball after crash ball. Uh, in Super Rugby, Adi, Z- Adi Sevilla is probably my pick, and he's been floated around as Player of the Year. Um, just as a few examples of what a few examples of what he's done this season against the Sharks in Durban, he had a, a game high six turnovers. Um, if against the Highlanders in Dunedin, he scored two tries. Uh, during against the Chiefs in Wellington early in the year, he produced a season high seventeen tackles. Um, and he also included a, he was part of a try that <laughs> we talk about how great New Zealand rugby is with attacking in terms of attacking talent, but he, that try that he was part of was very much next level. So there's a few uh, standout moments for him this season, but I think he's been very consistent. It, this is probably his coming of age season. He's the number one pick for me uh, ahead of Sam Kane for the All Blacks. Sam Kane is coming back from a neck injury, obviously, and it's great to see him come back. So I'm sure he'll be in the team. But Ardi Sevilla for me is just really, really next level. Uh, he's been picking his opportunities much better. His spatial awareness has increased a lot. One could argue that he's the best open side flanker in the world at the moment. And his ability to stay alive with the ball, that's a big thing I think in rugby is the players tend to go go down too quickly. But Sevilla 
seems to have the superhuman ability to just keep pushing and keep pushing. Um, and as I said, he's getting better and better and picking at picking his moments. Uh, to me, Richie McCall will always probably be the best, uh, the best flanker of all time. Um, with his, his specific ability to know when to come into a sort of tackle situation and pick the ball. But Sevilla, you know, for me, he's approaching those sorts of heights and hopefully he can keep his form going at the World Cup for the All Blacks. Other names in consideration for Super Rugby Player of the Year could be Scott Barrett from the Crusaders or Brad Weber or Anton Leonard Brown from the Chiefs. Obviously, there are South Africans and Argentinians we could throw in the mix. I don't think there were any standout Australians, unfortunately, or any players from the Sunwolves. Um, but if you guys, if there are any players who stood out for you, maybe Andre Pollard. Uh, I wouldn't say Elton Yankees. He hasn't been consistent enough for me. No one at the Lions, really. Um, not Warren Whiteley, not Quacha Smith. But yeah, let me know what you guys think. Do you think Adi Savia is the player of the year? There could also be a case, of, of course, for Richie Moonga, also from the Crusaders. Right, now moving on to results from, from the past weekend, and I hope all of you got to watch as much rugby as possible. The Highlanders beat the Waratahs by 49 points to 12. Um, the Highlanders have a huge number of players leaving, so it's going to be a big rebuilding job for them in the offseason. The Waratahs looked really out of it throughout the whole game, but I think they pretty much knew their season was over. They had to win big and hope other results also went in their favor, and it looked like they were pretty much over it, so <laughs> their season is over now. The Highlanders are, are going into the playoffs. In the next game, the Rebels, um, apologies, the Chiefs beat the Rebels by 59 points to 8. The Rebels had a small chance of making the playoffs, but I think last week's thumping at the hands of the Crusaders really took it out of them. I think there's something to be said for, you know, some psychological thing that happens when you lose by that much. You start to doubt your own abilities, and it looked like they were very much doubting themselves in this game. The return of Quade Cooper and Will Genia didn't help them at all, unfortunately for them. Uh, the Chiefs the Chiefs were absolutely ruthless. Uh, this is the kind of rugby they can play when they're playing at their best. I guess it's sort of the, the France conundrum as well. You either get a very good team or a very bad team. Uh, I think it's amazing for the Chiefs to make the playoffs after such an awful start to their season. So full kudos to them. And now they're going to have a chance, however small, to contest the playoffs. So good for them. In the next game, the Aguares beat the... Um, <coughs> the Aguares beat the Sunwolves. By 52 points to 10. They were absolutely ruthless in their final home game of the regular season. They showed all their class and attacking talent in beating the Sunwolves. Uh, the Sunwolves, you know, sadly played their last game of Super Rugby, so we bid adieu to them. I think the Aguares could have a real shot in the playoffs, especially as their opponents will have to travel to Argentina to play them in the first round. Of course, if they come up against the Crusaders in the final, I'll back the Crusaders, but the Aguares, I think, deserve to be here. They've come up top in the South African Conference and they've displayed some really, really good rugby throughout the season. The next game, which was a New Zealand derby, the Hurricanes beat the Blues by 29, 29 points to 24. The Hurricanes came back from big deficit in the first half to beat the Blues, who were at their inconsistent best. I realize that's maybe a contradiction in terms, but the Blues blow hot and cold like no other team in rugby that I know of. <laughs> Uh, without the Barrett brothers, so that's Bowden and Geordie, without Nani Laumape, the Canes, the Canes still played very well in the second, second half, and they were helped by characteristic Blues mistakes. Just on the Blues side, I really don't know about Sonny Bill Williams for the All Blacks. He's been inconsistent. He's had lots of injuries. I really can't think that you can take him ahead of other players, uh, so I really hope that they don't waste sort of that slot for the All Blacks on him. Um, they can't just take a chance with him that he can do one miracle offload in one game in a whole World Cup. To me, he's simply not consistent enough, either in his attacking or his, neither in his attacking nor in his defending. I would much rather take Ma Nonu, Ryan Crotty, Nane Lamape, and Jack Goodhue from the Crusaders. I think there are much better and more consistent names in there that, that the Crusaders should take. Uh, the next game, the in an Australian derby, the Brumbies beat the Reds by... 40 points to 27 and all I can say on that game is that it was the Brumbies sixth consecutive victory so they're building good momentum now before the playoffs we'll see what they can do uh, they don't really excite me a lot um, but they're a solid outfit so maybe on their day if they take their chances they could you know beat some of the weaker teams then the next one a 
the first of two South African derbies. The Sharks beat the Stormers by 12 points to 9. It was a really a boring game, unfortunately, <laughs> to sit through. Uh, neither team looked really smooth, despite it being the last game of the season. No one really looked settled. I don't know if they were nervous because there was so much riding on the game uh, in terms of playoff places. The only true excitement came at the end of the game as the Sharks pushed for the win and Lukanyo Am scored a try after the full-time Huta had sounded and so the, the Sharks are into the playoffs. In the final game of the weekend and of the round-robin stages for Super Rugby, the Bulls beat the Lions by 48 points to 27 at Loftus Fersfeld. Uh, whereas the first South African derby of the afternoon was awful, this one was full of excitement. Uh, it had all sorts of different permutations for the league table as the score changed. So it was very exciting to watch. The Bulls really turned it on in the second half and ran away with it. And, uh, you know, full credit to them. Uh, they started the season well, had their ups and downs, and now they're into the playoffs. Unfortunately, unfortunately for the Lions, after a few seasons in the playoffs, they're out this year. But hopefully they can bounce back next season. Just the final standings for the season. Uh, in the New Zealand Conference, the Crusaders are top. They've qualified. The Hurricanes have qualified. And then it's the Chiefs. They've also qualified. Highlanders, they've qualified. And the Blues are the one New Zealand team to miss out on the playoffs. In the South African Conference, we've got the Jaguares who finished top. So they've qualified. The Bulls qualified. And then the Sharks also qualified. Then we had the Lions and the Stormers. And they've missed out on the playoffs. In the Australian Conference, the Brumbies were top. They've qualified. And then the Rebels, Waratahs, Reds, and Sunwolves all miss out. So again, uh, the Aussie conference failing to deliver. As we know, Australian rugby has its issues, and it seems like those are going to continue. Maybe the Wallaby team for the World Cup can, you know, buck that trend, but we'll have to see what happens. For me, the player of the week was Andre Pollard, the fly half of the Bulls. He scored one try, kicked, kicked five conversions and one penalty in their win over the Lions. Um, he guided the game really well, uh, in my view. Even when the, the balls were behind and the Lions were on the front foot, he managed to, to turn the game around. His kicking out of hand was really good. He turned the Lions a few times and I think his ga he gave his team some real momentum. So he's obviously going to be a key player for the Springboks in the World Cup as well. They'll be hoping that he doesn't get injured or anything in the playoffs. Um, but yeah, a really, really good performance by Andre Pollard. So this coming weekend, we've got the quarterfinals uh, on Friday. That's So all of these will be in South African time. On Friday, the 21st of June at 9.35 a.m., we've got the Crusaders hosting the Highlanders. Uh, my Crusaders are... Um, my Crusaders, there you go. There's a little bit of a, <laughs> of a slip for you. They are my... My favorite team, um, but I think they're serious favorites in this matchup and indeed throughout the playoffs. So I think they're going to beat the Highlanders by at least 10 points. That'll be my pick. The next game, we've got the Aguares. They're going to host the Chiefs on Saturday, the 22nd of June at 5 past 12 a.m. For those of you in South Africa, I think this is going to be a really, really good game. I'm sure the crowd will be up for the Jaguares, uh, that's the Argentinian side in Super Rugby, so I'm sure the, the crowd is going to be there in force and they're going to be cheering them on. I've got the Jaguares there by seven. I'll give them home ground advantage. I think they're a bit more settled than the Chiefs, and the Chiefs obviously have to fly from New Zealand to Argentina. Next game on Saturday at 9.35 a.m., we've got the Hurricanes versus the Bulls. I'll pick the Hurricanes by 10 here. Uh, the the Bulls have to fly across to New Zealand. The Hurricanes, you know, they they can be scary good. They're one team I could see beating the Crusaders, for example. I'm sure they'll have the Barrett brothers back. They'll have Nan Nani La Mape back, Adi Savia. Um, I think they can seriously hurt the Bulls. Maybe the Bulls can manage to keep them, keep the score low. Maybe if it rains, that'll help the Bulls. But I foresee the Hurricanes winning that one. And then the last quarterfinal game, we have the Brumbies against the Sharks. That's in, in Canberra, in Australia, and that's at 12.05 p.m. on Saturday. In that game, I've got the Brumbies by 10. I simply don't think the Sharks will have enough to really bother the Brumbies. Um, for as boring as the Brumbies are, I think they'll have enough to beat the Sharks. Okay, so that we're done with Super Rugby for this week. Um, try and watch all the quarterfinals if you can. I'm hoping for some really exciting rugby. Maybe some players are going to try and showcase what they have to put themselves into contention for selection for the Rugby World Cup. In top 14, we had the final 
of that particular tournament in France. And in that game, Toulouse beat Clermont by 24 points to 18. I thought it was a really, really good game. I'm glad I got to watch. Uh, Toulouse came in as favorites. Their captain is Jerome Kaino. Uh, Cheson Colby, for those South Africans, you know, who, who know about him, he unfortunately got a yellow card, but apart from that, I thought he played quite well. Uh, Toulouse displayed excellent game management. Uh, just as an example of this, in the 61st minute, they had a very coherent, effective maul, uh, which led after many phases to a penalty and another three points to just extend their lead, but they were just uh, the more together outfit for me. Uh, and, uh, lastly, uh, Johan, Uge, he's a French international. He scored two tries for them. He plays on the wing. So he had a standout game in the final. Uh, on the World Rugby Under 20 Championship, uh, I'm not really going to talk about New Zealand that much because they were, <laughs> they were humbled in their previous game, unfortunately. So they're not in contention for any of the medals. But just to run through the results, uh, Georgia beat Fiji by 12 points to 8. Uh, Italy beat Scotland by 26 points to 19. Wales beat New Zealand by 8 points to 7. Uh, England beat Ireland by 30 points to 23. Australia beat Argentina by 34 points to 13, unfortunately for the Argentinian fans because they're playing in Argentina. And then for South Africa, unfortunately, they lost to France, who are the defending champions, by 20 points to 7. Uh, the French fly half Louis Carbonel kicked five penalties. South Africa were really their own worst enemy. They kept on infringing at the ruck. They were offsides. They were ill-disciplined and they, they'll probably, I think they'll feel that they shot themselves in the foot. Not that, you know, the French took their chances, but I don't think they did anything really special to win. So the fixtures coming up on Saturday, the 22nd of June, for those of you in South Africa, if you'd like to watch, and I encourage you to watch all these youth games because you might see some players who will feature for the Springboks in the future. For the third, fourth playoff, we've got South Africa against Argentina. And then the final will be Australia versus France, which I'll definitely try to watch. Uh, hopefully that'll be a good one. So a reminder that's on f on Saturday, the 22nd of June. <sighs> Excuse me. Um, on to schoolboy rugby. Um, the particular game I got to watch this weekend was between Michael House and Hilton College. They played at Michael House. It was the 202nd game between these two sides. That just shows you some of the history in South Africa with schoolboy rugby, how old these schools are, how far they go back. 202 games. That is nothing to smoke at uh, or to turn up your nose at. There were 6,000 people in attendance. I know for some of the Cape school derbies, that's peanuts, but... I think for a, a KZN derby, that is that is seriously good. Hilton came in as favorites for this game. Uh, their forwards are really, really, really good. They've got one prop. I can't remember his name now. I think his name is De Oliveira, but he probably weighs at least 130 kgs, <laughs> which is crazy for a schoolboy. But he was massive, uh, and he played quite well. It was interesting watching him in the scrum and how things had to change around, how his forwards had to sort of work things out around him, but it was still fun to watch. Uh, I thought number eight, uh, the the number eight for Hilton, Mark Armstrong, was man of the match. He was really, really good. And then the final score, Hilton beat Michael Aus by 28 points to eight. For those of you who might be based in Johannesburg, if you're a St. John's or a St. Stithian's old boy, this weekend those two schools are playing against each other at St. John's. So I'm going to try and go and watch and I'll report back on that. St. John's have had a really good season so far. Hopefully they can beat St. Stithians as well. Right, guys. Um, that's all the, the news and results from this last uh, weekend's rugby. I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode. Thank you once again for tuning in. Uh, just a reminder, please follow me on Twitter. That is at ChrisHot11. So that's at C-H-R-I-S-H-A-T-T-1-1. Please follow Pod Media. That's at Pod Media S A. So at P O D M E D I A S A. Uh, if you find me on Twitter or on Facebook, please leave any links to any great tries that you've seen, all of your thoughts and comments on what I've talked about here, any of the news, the transfer news, the results. Please give me your predictions for the coming weeks' fixtures, especially in Super Rugby. Let me know um, what you think is going to happen. Please remember to subscribe to this podcast wherever you might be listening to it. You can find the podcast on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, CastBox, Google Podcasts, Spreaker, and really any other good podcasting app. 
please share the link to the podcast all over your social media platforms and tell your friends about it, uh, whether you're in a pub or a braai. Let them know about the podcast and hopefully they can start commenting and sharing and contributing. I hope you all have a good week ahead uh, and that you manage to watch at least all of the Super Rugby action this coming weekend and, and that uh, there are some good results. For those of you um, who maybe would like to back the outside horse, back the Highlanders against the Crusaders, <laughs> and if the Highlanders manage to beat the Crusaders, you can let me have it. Uh, next week <laughs> in the comments uh, I'll, I'll probably put my house on the crusaders winning that game but with rugby you never know so let's see what happens um, thank you all once again for tuning in and i'll talk to you again soon cheers 